one of the best tools that you can kind of get exposed to and little by little start building out. Subscriptions are always worth it. Okay, I'm gonna explain this why. Because at this point, I do it very passively. It doesn't take that much of my time to bring in new clients. For a new practice type, basically get an entire system up and running and generating clients within less than a day. Welcome to my legal academy, helping lawyers work smart, scale fast, and enjoy life. With your firm's use of Jotform, in what way is that then the data that you collect communicating with the other data or technology that you're using? I don't use Jotform, so you know, are there built in APIs? Are you using like a Zapier or a Make? Like how are you having it communicate with other technology at your firms? Yeah, so Jotform just collects the information. Now you need to integrate that information to go to the next step, which is basically give a notification to our team. You use that information to start filling out some paperwork. And for that, I've been using the biggest automation tool online, Zapier. Uh, I've been also a longtime user of Zapier and I've been able to take Zapier and really use it more and more every day. These days I have 220,000 automations per month that are running through my operations, which is the maximum plan on Zapier is 50,000. I've been able to quadruple the maximum plan. And yeah, it's a higher leverage kind of thing that you can do. Again, take information. Usually there's two pieces of information that you need to automate. One is what happens when leads come in. And the second is what happens when new clients come in. So this is something uh, kind of a, it's a technical part of our program teaching you. We have a team that helps set these things up. And I'm actually uh, just in two weeks, I'm doing a free training basically called Zapier for lawyers. I automate 220,000 automations per month using Zapier. It won't, but what I can do is I can, I can promote the training and say upcoming guest on Law Subscribed is having this training, go to the training. And then in, you know, a few weeks we can, you can listen to the we could listen sure. to the episode. Or or if you actually just go on YouTube right now, when you're listening to this, go on YouTube, search for My Legal Academy, find my channel, and the training will be posted there. Just go, you'll find the Zapier training. If not already, I've actually did a Zapier training two and a half years ago. I've been talking about Zapier for a while, and it's all there. Zapier is probably one of the best tools that you can kind of get exposed to and little by little start building out. You know, these tools and stuff is not gonna go away. It just becomes more and more important over time. And the lawyers and law firm owners who are able to leverage these things sooner, then they're able to kind of grow faster and kind of get ahead of the pack. So yeah, if you've been exposed to job form and Zapier and you haven't really implemented these things, these are really crucial and uh, definitely take advantage of it. Yeah, you know, some of the technology that we've talked about, uh, uh, Zapier and uh, job form, you know, these are, uh even arguably virtual assistants, right? You're talking about monthly subscriptions, you know, or bi-weekly if you're paying a VA bi-weekly, right? So this is the Law Subscribed podcast. So we're all about subscriptions. So what other subscriptions are you paying for that power your law firm, Sam? <laughs> at least 60 to 100, at least if not more. <laughs> and the reason is I realized early in my career that subscriptions are always worth it. Okay, I'm gonna explain this why. The reasons why subscriptions are, are so amazing is once the creator of the subscription builds it, then it doesn't take that much more effort or input to be able to take on a new client. It, let's just take a job form. Job form, once they build a product, it doesn't matter if they have a thousand clients or 1200 clients. It's still, maybe they have to pay a little bit more for the server, or the hosting, but that's very minimal compared to the value that they bring. So if that's the case, then in order for the software and the subscription to grow, people usually price it somewhere at a level where the most people can join the subscription then if that's the case usually the value is much higher than the price that the owner puts for what this is so the value is very high for subscriptions so that's one idea second is with just like in most things in life if you use something it's worth it if you don't use something it's not worth it so let's just take an example like the gym it doesn't matter if the gym is 300 dollars a month if you use it and it's a good gym it's worth it but if you have a gym that's $20 a month that you don't use, then it's not worth it. So it just really comes down, are you using it? So if that's the case for me. I kind of put myself through that test. Every tool that I get exposed to, I don't sign up for it right away. I usually at this point, I just park it to make sure that I actually need it. A lot of people like kind of get excited about something and to go sign up for it. Over time, you know, you realize that you probably don't need 80% of the tools you get exposed to. So first, you know, first thing it's, I would say park it for a couple of days and see whether that excitement is still there. If it is, then what I would do is sign up for it on a monthly basis. It's a rule of thumb. I have every subscription that I have for me, I don't want anything long-term. I want 30 days, am I gonna use this? Now at the same time, when I sign up for it, I put a, a reminder in my to-do list. In 28 days, 
to say upgrade, I ask myself a very polarizing question. Upgrade to yearly or cancel? And when I ask that polarizing question, within 20 days, I should I be clear? Am I going to be using this long term or do I really not need this? At that point, uh, kind of decide whether it's for me or not. But kind of using this model, you know, I have a list of I have at least like 40 right in front of me. Plenty of them, plenty of tools. But one of my favorite one that I love and something that I've been preaching about for the last many years, and I think anybody who goes and implements it always come back and rave about it, is Loom. Loom is a video tool that allows you to quickly record videos on your computer. And it's perfect for whenever you're looking to delegate or you don't want to do something, quickly click on two buttons, re uh, record a Loom video, and you uh, automatically upload the video. It gives you a link. You can send out, you can message out that link to say, hey, this is how you do this thingy, do this for me, and try to get this done within the next you know, 24 hours. And basically, you know, I've been looming all I, I loomed all day long just to give instructions, delegate it out, kind of oversee the big picture. Yeah, that tool is actually also part of my my talk on how to launch a subscription model for your for your law firm, which I'm giving at the ABA Tech Show. We're recording before the tech show, but when this goes live, it will be after. And Loom has certainly optimized for certain things, right? Like the link sharing stuff. Right. I mean, Zoom does this, too. So, you know, if you are if you're already using Zoom, you, know, you can screen record. It's a little bit more clunky. It's not as streamlined. How things are stored is different. You have to have a good system and management. You know, if you're not using Loom, there are other tools. Bubble is one. Even just OBS. If you're an OBS user for video stuff, then um, then OBS also has a screen record tool. But Loom has done a really good job of sort of optimizing for the sharing thing. So asynchronous communication with your team, but also, Sam, asynchronous communication with your clients, right? So like instead of having to explain something to your client a million times, you could record a Loom explaining a contract, explaining a pleading, explaining discovery and what needs to be answered. And your client can watch it a million times and you only have to record that conversation once, right? So like how are you, are you also using Loom in your client facing work? Totally, yeah. Usually, you know, you have three parties, <laughs> you, your prospects, clients or opposing counsels. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for each of those, uh, totally. Hey, hope you're enjoying the video so far. If you're a lawyer and you're looking to work smart, scale fast and enjoy life, right below this video, you'll find a link to book a call to speak to my team. So we can tell you how we've been able to help over 500 law firm owners scale their law firm. Now back to the video. So, I mean, we, I've been so excited with the technology and there's a lot more to talk about, right? But also, let us I, I, I want to know more about the law firms, right? So you have six law firms. Maybe a better question for an interviewer to ask would be, let's let's talk about that first law firm. If you just got it started or you acquired it, how that worked? I mean, all the law firms are built from scratch. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, either a 100% shareholder or there are some that I'm a partners in. And the ones that I'm partners in, I'm on the focus on the business development side, client generation and automations and system side. And then I have partners who are kind of like, one is kind of like operations, another one is legal. And then we have one that's also on the business development side with me. So it depends, um, different practice types, different roles, but across all of them, the focus for me is always client generation, business development and systems and automations. So we'll just call you the ultimate rainmaker. I, it's up to me. It's a, it's a, it's a lot of pressure, but it's good pressure because I know how to do it. Cause at this point I do it very passively. It doesn't take that much time of my time to bring in new clients. What I do is I'm very, I'm very good at, at creating ads and funnels and automations. And I'm able to even these days, like in less than two hours for a new practice type, basically get an entire system up and running and generating clients within less than a day. Mm -hmm. Sounds crazy, but yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. That's uh that's excellent. Certainly as a solo practitioner, my, my uh, ears are, are perked up at, uh, at hearing that. So talk about personal injury. We're talking about real estate. Like what, what are the practice areas that your, your firms operate in? Employment law, uh, lemon law, car accidents. Uh, I've done property damage, which I stopped. I've done workers comp, which I stopped. Business law and transactional, like LLCs and S-Corps. We also have the biggest um, service for ITINs, ITIN numbers, individual taxpayer application numbers. And then I also have a folder full of 60 other things that I've researched and I'm potentially going to get into as long as I find the right partners to do it with. Right, right. And so part of that too is, uh, uh, are you hiring? Do you need me to put a link to, uh, you know, any oh, attorney yeah. listeners, you know? Yeah, that's by far my biggest need across everything that, uh, that we do is just solid team, solid people who are long-term thinkers and are willing to kind of hold it down. Uh, my secret sauce with hiring is just to meet and talk to as many people, figure out what you're good at, what you enjoy doing. And then I have plenty of positions, I have multiple positions for every role you can possibly think about. So if anybody needs a job or anything, or if you know anybody that needs a job, find my contact information 
uh, send me an email, sam at malaylaw.com. Send me an email. I'm always, always recruiting. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and that's coming from an attorney who has created other efficiencies in their business, right? So at the point that you're ready to hire, I mean, it's grow, baby, grow, right? <laughs> I mean, once, once you're hiring. Yeah, yeah. Let me also share one epiphany I had. A lot of lawyers, a lot from owners go through phases where, okay, now I need to hire. It doesn't work that way. Recruiting is a nonstop activity. You should always be recruiting. Always, 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 day in, day out. Be on the lookout. There's a really good book called Who? We're basically, you know, be on the lookout for people that you can always, you know, bring onto your team because your team is one of your biggest assets for your law firm. So, um, so you're covering a lot of different practice areas, uh, which is really interesting. I mean, again, six firms. How are you handling the billing? Are you still doing billable hour, contingency, flat fee, subscriptions? Like, wh like, in what ways are you are you billing clients? They're usually contingency, and you know, and most of it is pre-lit, but some of it is also litigation. But we have in-house, you know, uh, uh, lawyers who are handling the, the legal side of things. Yeah, yeah, and, and so, but with unless you're billing by the hour, if you're a flat fee contingency or subscription attorney, all the efficiencies in your practice are absolutely necessary because you're you're only making money when you're making money. It's not about billing time; it's about being able to scale. So, um, so that's interesting to hear. It's contingency. I and just for you, just this is this is the part of the show where I try to convince my guests if they're not using the subscription model to use the subscription model. You know, depending on the clients, and obviously you'll have to do your own research on this. But there are even some personal injury attorneys who are starting to use subscriptions and making clients pay for the fees for things. So, like court reporter fee or expert fee, and you pay a certain amount a month, and then instead of taking a third, maybe they take twenty percent. Right. And so giving clients certain optionality and that allows and, and depending on the scale of your practice and the way that you're that you've built it out, that allows for more guaranteed and monthly recurring revenue. And depending on your volume, it could actually end up being a lot of money, which could allow you to have more money up front to go spend on more things to leverage in other ways. Right. So have you ever thought about using the subscription model in one of those ways? Yeah. My legal academy is, is a subscription based kind of community <laughs> and resource. So totally. But something I want to share that came to me is when people try to create a subscription, they try to fit their service to the offer. Okay, that means I'm a state planning lawyer. I'm going to make create an, a state planning subscription. That's the wrong way to kind of think about it. I think the better way is to focus on the who. Create a subscription around the who first. That means you pick a who, these types of people. They just say divorce moms or soccer moms or whatever. And you ask yourself, if I'm this person, what do I need in my life? And you have to basically create resources and things that are beneficial for this who. Start off with the who instead of thinking about these are my services and how do I create an offer around the services. So create an offer based on the who first. It's, it's a very subtle kind of way of thinking about it. But if you're focusing on the who, things become a lot more clear. Start with the who when you're creating a subscription. Yeah, no, it's, it's a really good point. And uh, while I don't necessarily talk about it a lot or enough, is like having a, a client or customer avatar, right? Or an ideal client. And that goes into that aspect of it. If you've already spent the time to come up with your customer or client avatar, then your your who is a little bit more actualized and it might be easier to answer that question. So that's like another exercise you could do before coming up with a subscription model, right? Totally, and I, I remember I used to hear about the who Early on too, and I was ignoring it. I'm like, yeah, sure, sure. It's like a marketing fundamental thing that everybody has to go through. Like it's like a chapter in a book you have to read. But more and more that I got dwelt into it, I'm like, no, it really is true. Even with, you know, my legal academy, the I didn't start off with the offer. I didn't start off with anything. Very first thing I did was I created a Facebook group and I focused in on the who, the community, the lawyers first for six months. And I just focused on that, finding the most value, being a good person, uh, with the right intentions for those first six months. And then afterwards, I, then I went to create an offer and then, you know, doing my first pitch.